Welcome to Simply Superior. I'm Robin Washington. Isle Royale is the largest island in the largest lake in the world. But if you're looking for people who live there full time, you won't find any. There are about a dozen wolves, a couple thousand moose, and weather permitting, a hiker or two exploring its inlets and trails. One of those is Allison Young, whose story about how she became a hiker, logging 12,000 miles across six continents, is as interesting as the places she's explored. She's a former concert flutist, or flautist, and I'm going to let her decide which one she prefers, with major <laughs> orchestras. Then she became a classical music radio host before her current application as, as she calls herself, the Blissful Hiker. And she joins me now. Welcome to Simply Superior, Allison Young. Thank you so much, Robin. It's great to be here. So is it flutist or flautist? I think, is it Isle Royal or is it Isle Royale? You know what? We'll go with whatever <laughs> <laughs> sounds comfortable at the time coming out of our mouths. So uh, you played with some pretty major orchestral outfits, such as the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and you had to be pretty good to get into that. Yes. I was pretty good. Uh, so I had a full career as a professional musician. And about 20 years ago, I developed a neurological condition that's called dystonia. It's a kind of puzzling and baffling issue, um, a neurological very similar to like Parkinson's or essential tremor. And um, it affected uh, my hands to the point that I couldn't play at the level that was required to play in a Boston Symphony Orchestra or Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. So I, um, I really needed to leave that piece of my career and find something else to do. It was a difficult time, as you can imagine. I mean, losing something that it's not really just like your identity or, you know, your source of income, but it's kind of your sense of, of purpose. Um, so that was a difficult time. And actually, it's interesting because the trail has always been a place I've gone to. Nature, walking outdoors has always been a place that grounded me, a place that helped me kind of get more in conversation with the spirit. So anyway, I did some major hikes. I mean, I walked um, in a uh, backpack solo in um, Texas, out in Guadalupe and um, in Big Bend. And I realized that like letting go and seeing what was going to be open to me next um, was like a really valuable thing to be willing to do, to sort of quit. Um, <laughs> and what I opened to, interestingly enough, was a position like what you have. I became a radio host, um, kind of fell into that, but found that to be a really easy and interesting transition to host classical music. And um, I was in Houston, Texas for a couple of years, and then I came up here to St. Paul and worked at American Public Media and Minnesota, Minnesota Public Radio. And um, and that was like a really, really cool time. But through all of this, I was always kind of returning to, you know, to the trail, to the outdoors, to get even more in touch with, you know, sort of the person I am and sort of where I fit in, I guess you could say, in like a, in the cosmos. So uh, I know mountaineers climb mountains because they're there. Uh, <laughs> you've been hiking all over the place. Yeah. When did that become serious? Yeah. I mean, it's serious all the way from the start. My earliest memory as a child is um, walking and looking at my little shoes, sort of moving me forward and how like powerful that was. You know, it went on to you know, wanting to explore. It's, it's a sense of curiosity. Um, and, you know, you bring up the idea of a mountain climber and they say, because it, because it is there. But the idea is like, why are you going? Well, simply because I want to see and I want to know. I want to know what it is. What can my, my body, my mind, and my spirit experience um, when I go to this new place? I mean, whether it's something like Isle Royale, which is you know, close by is not as, as difficult of an exploration as something like Everest or some of the other hikes I've done, which have had no trail or have been in foreign countries or have, you know, been filled with a lot of obstacles, you know, then that becomes more heavy on the side of, of you know, what your body can do and what you can like physically handle. We're speaking with Allison Young. She's a classical flutist or flautist turned radio host turned blissful <laughs> hiker. She's produced a podcast about her hiking on Isle Royale in the summer of 2020. So yes, it was there. You decided to hike it and you went to the island. Now, what did you know about the island, by the way, before you got there? You looked at a map. You said you thought it was part of Minnesota like everybody does. <laughs> you realized it was <laughs> Michigan. And we've talked about that on this show a lot 
at some point we will tell the whole story of the Toledo War <laughs> that was between uh, right. Ohio and whatever, and it ended up mm-hmm. in the, the UP becoming part of Michigan. So anyway, uh, what did you know? And and yes, it was there. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting thinking of like all of the places that I had been. Um, you know, just to tell you a little bit more about my my podcast. It's called Blissful Hiker, and it's um, of all of my hikes. So I have, um, you know, chapters on New Zealand and chapters on the PCT and chapters on Wind River Range, Arizona Trail, a lot of different places I've been. But I have, um, you know, sort of five different episodes on Isle Royal. And it's always kind of interesting how we skip places that are closest to us. Mm -hmm. I mean, the island, it's so close yet it's so far, right? So from St. Paul or from Superior, Wisconsin, I mean, you'd, you'd drive up the North Shore, most likely, of Minnesota and get to the island from there. Or you could go to the Keweenaw Peninsula. But, you know, all of that is going to require, it requires time to drive. It requires getting a ferry or getting a plane. And it just all seemed like a little bit too much planning or too much requirement to get that kind of time to do it. And it's not cheap, I understand. And it's not cheap, right. I spent $366 for a plane flight. Hmm. It's, it's pretty expensive. Um, so I kind of put it off because it felt so far. I still did, you know, the Superior Hiking Trail. I've hiked a lot of the North Country Trail. I've done the, you know, Kekakabek and the border route. But the island just kind of kept um, getting out of my grasp. And the year before, I had set these really large goals. I walked all of New Zealand on the Te Araroa, which is, uh, it's, it's like the Appalachian Trail of New Zealand. So that took me five months. And then I took another five months to walk the PCT. So approximately 5,000 miles with other hikes that I added into that as well. And um, I came home and it was kind of time to take a break, you know. And then the pandemic hit and it was such a weird time for all of us. It's, it's, it's hard to look back on those very first days of how, you know, we thought we needed to wipe everything down and we thought we couldn't even be outside near people. Mm-hmm. And then something really weird happened that summer. I mean, not only did COVID hit, but I got this weird pull of a muscle in uh, my inner thigh. And I thought, oh, you know, I've just stepped funny or something. And it was not getting better. My gait started to get weird. Like I couldn't step properly. And, um, and during, you know, and I just, I was just kind of walking in state parks. I wasn't doing anything really major, maybe a few overnights, but nothing really major. And a friend of mine said to me, you know, Isle Royale is open um, right now. And I said, no, I heard that they've closed everything. And he said, well, they're, they're flying planes there. So you could take a plane and you could still backpack. And I thought, you know, that sounds like something I should do right now because it didn't seem really, really big. I'm in pain, but you know, I'm ignoring, I'm taking a lot of, we call it vitamin I, you know, ibuprofen. Um, and I could do that. So my husband and I drove up there and, um, he, you know, set me on the little plane. <laughs> and, um, the first indication that something was seriously wrong with me is, you know, I sort of hopped up onto, cause it's a float plane, you know, and I hopped up onto it and I was really wobbly. I mean, I couldn't stand on it. And the pilot just you know, reached out and grabbed me. And I thought, this is not a good sign at all. <laughs> so anyway, I, I took the plane there, but I planned a lot of time. I set aside basically nine days, um, two halves of days and seven in between. And, um, and Isle Royale is great because they don't require you to specifically choose where you're going to camp. I mean, they, they encourage that you have some sort of itinerary and kind of a plan so they know where you're going. And so I had a lot of time to play with. I brought plenty of food because you never know if you can get off the island. You know, it it sort of reminds me of the movie version of Never Cry Wolf, where the pilot, the bush pilot, does exactly what you're talking about and dumps the guy in the middle of nowhere. And (laughs) bye, have a good time. Oh, I know. Yeah. How deserted was it? It's very remote, right? So it's closed. There were no ferries, but people came in um, private boats. Mm -hmm. So I met a, a couple of boaters. And, you know, if I was really in trouble, I would, you know, I, I guess I could get a ride off. I also always carry um, a Garmin um, InReach Mini. It's a, it's a little GPS um, kind of, it weighs three ounces. It's a little tiny piece of gear. And um, there's several things that you can do with this. 
I am able to have a two-way, so I can have a conversation um, with someone. So I can actually tell Richard, my husband, I'm starting my trail, and then he can follow my track. Ah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I mean, I can tell him, you know, I'm having a good time, or I really need to leave early, or can you see if there's another flight, or you know, there's there's ways you can communicate. It's life-saving because the most important bit of gear on there is the SOS. We're speaking with Allison Young. We're talking about her hiking of Isle Royale in the summer of 2020. Tell us uh, what you saw. It's a pretty exciting and magical place. And so what was happening to me, and I was talking about this um, pain that I was having, and I later learned that actually what, what was going on is arthritis through my body, and I was losing all of the cartilage in my hips. Hmm. And so later that fall, I had both of them replaced. It was pretty serious. So I was walking on, um, you know, on hips that weren't really working. And what that caused me to do, which I found um, kind of a gift in a certain way, I couldn't go as fast. I couldn't go as far. So my days were shorter. I mean, I think I had one 15-mile day. So some people would say that's pretty far. But um, I didn't have these kind of like pushing 20-mile days or really going all day. And so that slowing down you know, allowed me to appreciate and kind of be a little bit more alert and open to what was happening on the island. And your listeners may know that Isle Royale is, um, has a history. It's the longest running uh, predator prey study in the world. I think it started in the 50s. And um, no one is exactly certain how the moose got there. There's some argument that they actually swam or they walked across the ice but they weren't there before 1900. And so once the moose established themselves on the island, the wolves soon followed (laughs) because they're a source of food. So there's been this interesting intricacy between the wolves and the moose and how they've kept themselves um, at the right numbers for so long. But also Isle Royale is one of the only places, I think it might be the only place in the world, where wolves and moose live without black bear, because that's the, that's like the third piece of this um, sort of uh, large animal triangle, I guess. I'm right. not a scientist, but, right. but it's, it's, you know, there's no bear there. Um, there are no deer. Uh, there are no porcupines. Um, but there are beavers. But they're beaver, which, and no one knows exactly how they got there. So like the numbers are on the mainland, we have 40 species of animals. And on Isle Royale, there's 18 species of animals. And the ranger, Jenna, was the the gal I talked to. She said, we are not entirely sure how beaver got here, for instance, or how otter, um, how did the foxes, these beautiful red foxes, and in a somewhat smallish area, um, the possibility that you'll see animals is usually greater than it would be if you're hiking something like the Superior Hiking Trail. Right. And you did see some of the animals. I did. Yeah. Yes. So when I went out, Jenna told me a couple of things. First, she said, if you see a moose, you use the rule of thumb. You hold your thumb up as you're looking at the moose. And if you can cover it, you know you're far enough away <laughs> um, from the moose. And interestingly, moose are far more dangerous than wolves. Wolves have no interest in humans. They don't want to attack you. Um, and all the fairy tales, you know, good, they're great, but that's not really reality. Um, moose are, can be very um, capricious and, you know, quite suddenly run at you and they're giant. So you have to be quite careful. Uh, the safest thing to do is put yourself behind a tree because it's difficult for them to, to maneuver to you. And just on day two, I saw a giant moose, a, a, a bull with, you know, the huge bullwinkle, you know, horn <laughs> of, or rack, I guess. And I was you know, sort of just simply walking on the trail and I, I didn't hear a sound. I just had a, had kind of a gut feeling and I turned to the right and there he was. Um, definitely my thumb could not cover him. He was right there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was like, Ooh, and I started to kind of back up and find a tree. And then I realized he was really, he was just kind of standing there. He's sort of chewing his cud. I don't know if they chew cud, but that's what it looks like. <laughs> and I, just, you know, snapped his picture and just very quietly walked past. Um, and that wasn't the first, I think I saw a, like five or six. Um, I mean, I'd have to look back at my numbers. I saw many on my, uh, on my walk and, um, and heard a lot of them because sometimes they don't want to just stand there. They were, they're a little afraid of you. Mm-hmm. As far as wolves, um, I saw lots of tracks. 
I heard them um, at night. And I was told also by the rangers that they wanted us to to try to document where we saw something. So like if you saw something you thought was wolf uh, scat, it's usually fairly obvious because there's hair in it. You know, to take a picture and to, you know, tell them, document it where, where it was, because they're trying to understand how the wolf um, population is, you know, separating into packs. And where they are. So you saw evidence of wolves. Uh, I know that you saw a fox. Definitely. And you also had an encounter with uh, some aquatic creatures. Yeah. So, okay. So um, just really quickly to the foxes, I will tell you that if, if you're listening to this program to plan your own trip to Isle Royale, you should be certain to carry something to protect your food because the red foxes are very wily and <laughs> fly and they come right in and take your goodies away from you. Um, sometimes it can even be your shoes. So look out for the foxes, but they're absolutely beautiful. Um, these, these red foxes with these big bushy tails, they're just gorgeous. Um, I went to Mosky Basin, which is a gorgeous area on the south part of the island. The water's fairly shallow there and it warms up and I had a really warm, sunny day. So I, um, I just kind of started putting my feet in the water and slowly working my body to go in. And it was, it was quite refreshing. I was very, very happy. And I came out and kind of lifted myself onto the rock veranda. And I looked down at my lower legs and I thought that somehow I got covered in pine needles. You know, I thought, well, maybe they'd fallen into the water and they're stuck on my body. And I tried to brush them off and they wouldn't come off because they were leeches. It was so gross hundreds of leeches and apparently they come kind of in swarms and because i was just sitting there you know like a beached whale for so long <laughs> um they they had plenty of time to attach as i as i tried to pull them off i mean i was you know you can you can imagine the sounds coming out of my mouth i just you know i'm grossed out i'm horrified i'm screaming um i'm pulling each one off with my fingers but they attach to my fingers <laughs> So the only way to finally get them off was with was with tweezers and you know they're full of blood it was it was horrifying and i was feeling very sorry for myself and there is a a dock there and it had been damaged so they closed off the end with this orange plastic you know that kind of safety fencing and all of a sudden i saw a little bit of movement and i thought something's at the end of the dock And I walked out slowly. I was very chastened. So I was moving, you know, very slow and very quietly. And it was an otter, this giant, fat, blubbery (laughs) otter who'd, you know, hoisted himself up. And he was, um, he was cleaning. He was doing like his toilette, licking and cleaning and sort of preening his beautiful fur. And I stood there. I mean, I must have been there a half hour, absolutely still. And he kept looking up like he knew something was there, but he couldn't focus on me because I was behind the orange. Um, you know, it, it, it's confusing looking. It's orange and it has little holes in it. He, he so may he have been tell. using the rule of otter thumb. But yes, his otter <laughs> thumb. Exactly. And this thought came into my mind. I thought, how the heck did he get up on this? It's, it's pretty high. And right when I had that thought, another otter hoisted himself right up he just sort of he just sort of threw his body in one motion from swimming and flopped onto the dock also well i think it speaks to the uh the mystery of the animals there and their abilities uh, that actually lead to how they got there in the first place right again we're speaking with allison young we're talking about her hiking isle royal in the summer of 2020 and uh, you uh, of course are producing a podcast about it you have a little clip for it can you set this up for us yes this is just the very opening of uh, you know, a series of five um, different episodes from Blissful Hiker podcast where I focus on Isle Royale. So um, I take my phone with me. I mean, that's basically my computer when I hike, and I certainly take a lot of pictures. I take some video, but I also simply collect the sound in and of itself. So mm-hmm. in this particular clip, what I what I gathered, I'm standing there with my phone, and I'm kind of hanging down off a cliff um, towards the water. Uh, at, on Lake Superior, um, I'm actually at uh, um, I'm at Todd Harbor at this point, and the water is very gently 
coming up onto the rock and going underneath and making this kind of, you know, that kind of bloopy sound. Um, and, and I'm describing sort of uh, the experience of my first night at Isle Royale. All right. The setting sun pancakes into the clouds, orange and pink. Fog that hung over the water this morning and delayed my trip is gone now. Only a memory in washed-out haze on the horizon, fading into the slate-blue cliffs of Canada. A beaver swims towards me, crossing the cove in a half-submerged brown fuzz of determination. He leaves a ripply V-shaped wake in the mostly calm water, the gentle surge as though someone has given just one light tap to the big lake and set it in motion, thumping and fizzing in the crevices beneath me. What a perfect sight I have. A flat tent spot, a board bench for tea in the morning, and this private rock veranda. This is my first night on Isle Royale, at a place out of my way, not in the direction of my hike at all, and really an accidental landing pad. What force set things in motion to create the ideal circumstances to get me here? Whoever, whatever you are, thank you. And that was a clip from the podcast by the blissful hiker, Allison Young, our guest, and her hiking of Isle Royale in the summer of 2020. Uh, what was your total mileage? The island is 45 miles long. Did you go the breadth of it or width of it? or, or what? I did. Yes. Well, I left a lot of time. And sometimes that's really fun. You know, the, uh, people go for their FKT, their fastest known time. I tend to go for my S. KT, the slowest known time um, when, I'm, when I'm hiking. And so I left so much time that I was able to hike 90 miles. So there's 145 miles, I think, of trails on the island. So, you know, pretty significant amount of mileage. And you do have to take a lot of food for, for that many miles. <laughs> and you memorialized it for all of us to hear. Where can we uh, hear your podcast? It's on everywhere you get your podcast. So Apple, The Works. It's called Blissful Hiker. And you can listen to my podcast. I also am primarily a, a speaker. So I give a lot of presentations about what I do. You can go to my website, blissfulhiker.com. Great. We've been speaking with the blissful hiker, Allison Young. She's a classical flutist turned radio host turned blissful hiker who's hiked, uh, well, all over the place, but of particular interest to us, Isle Royal in the summer of 2020. Thank you for joining us, Allison. You bet. Thank you, Robin.